happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Day 40 of the national emergency and the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Are you still out there? I miss you. You know who I miss tonight? Billy Bo. Billy was the owner and chef at one of the city's best Italian restaurants. And Billy only ever had one request from everybody who worked there. Whether you were one of the cooks or you worked in the front of the house, the only thing he ever said was, don't fuck it up. And if you didn't understand the task, if you needed some clarification on some of the steps of the task that he asked you to complete, he would simply say it slower. Don't fuck it up. So, on this, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, as I sit in sequester, I can't help but think that maybe we effed something up. I'm not saying it's not something we can't fix, but maybe, just maybe, we've effed something up. News from the feed, big, huge, enormous congratulations to Thomas Caruso. Thomas is a friend and a director, and he directed Emoji Land. So yesterday, the Drama Desk Award nominations came out, and Emoji Land was nominated for four Drama Desk Awards. Emoji Land was like you went to see the show, and it was like going on a ride. It was incredible. And when I started to think about it just before, the, as the intro was rolling, uh, Katie and I went and saw the show, one of the last previews, I believe it was the end of January or very early in February. And Thomas, I think you gave Katie and I uh, the last party in the city. I think the last time we partied in the city was going to see Emoji Land. Congratulations, brother. And also worthy of note, Meredith Gordon, you know him, you love him, is part of a conversation with hospital clowns tomorrow at 4 p.m. Today is Earth Day, and I had a sit down earlier in the week with Mother Nature. Well, she sat down, I stood. I don't wanna say that Mother Nature was angry, but she totally wasn't happy. Happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Mother Nature here to uh, celebrate this, this very special day with you and the peoples of the Earth. Uh, there have been great advances in the last 50 years. There have also been two steps back, shall we say. I'm I'm surprised that we would need to have an Earth Day. Considering it is the air that you breathe, people of the Earth, and it is the water that you drink, I would think that it would be a no-brainer. Is that the expression being used? Yes. 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 We say that quite a bit here. Yes. Or no brains being used. I would think that it would be natural to keep things clean. You know, I do the best I can. I uh, set forth all of my fungus, uh, mushrooms to break down and decay and recycle all the things that die. Natural procession and progression, of course. But I set water systems to cleanse themselves. But I cannot do it alone. Some of the challenges I have faced. Oh. Let's start with the population. Fifty years ago, in 1970, there were 
3.5 billion people on your planet, and now there are seven. So we've doubled the number. I can pretty much tell you how that's working out. The usage of fossil fuel has increased 37 percent per person. The emission of CO2 into your atmosphere, 1.2 trillion tons of CO2. But the use of flying has increased 495 percent. I hope you heard that. And the ripping down of our beautiful forest, I would say betwixt you and I, I think it's becoming untenable. Interesting. Has anything good come out of the last 50 years? Absolutely. You know, there are so many brilliant scientists and ecologists and geologists working. There was the passage of the Endangered Species Act. Thankfully, there have been a few species that were listed that are now off the list. The humpback whale has made a comeback. Have you ever seen a humpback whale, Scott? Uh, not in person. Mm. Well, they are majestic. Some small progress has been made. Are there ways that we can all help? I'm so happy you asked. You know, Scott, even the little things, there are seven billion of you. If everyone did a small thing daily, it would make a vast difference. Seven billion small things a day. Of course it would make a difference. Using bags over and over again at the grocery store and those single-use bottles. Oh my goodness, I, I, I really can't get started on the single-use plastic bottles. Obviously, cleaning up our litter, planting wildflowers for the bees, the dear sweet honeybees to cross-pollinate. Scott, your food chain needs them. Just uh, FYI. Huh. It is up to you. You have the knowledge to make a difference in the future. And only those who come after us will know whether you succeeded. Huh. Wow, that is quite a challenge that you give us, Mother Nature. I hope that we can live up to it. Yeah. So do I. Wow. You see what I'm saying? She, she didn't seem like she was angry really but she totally wasn't happy now i think she's definitely asking us to look inside and also look outside and do something about the shenanigans that we've gotten ourselves into carla rhodes is a wildlife conservation photographer hello carla well, hi, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, on thank you. Hey, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. What does it mean to document wildlife with empathy and understanding? Well, I'm a wildlife conservation photographer. So that really, you know, empathy and understanding really sums up the core of my values. It means that I respect my subject that I'm shooting with my camera, that I want to keep a respectable distance from uh, whichever cr creature it may be, and I want to follow truth and captioning, and I just want to respect my subjects. Um, and hopefully that comes through in my photos and have a lot of empathy and understanding for what I'm shooting and share that with the world. Okay, now how does wildlife conservation photography differ from, let's say, standard wildlife photography? This is a very good question. I'm pretty strict about calling myself uh, a conservation photographer because this is a very uh, important movement in wildlife photography. In the past, you've probably seen photos of like an epic owl flying towards the camera. That's my pet parrot, Colonel Musk who have decided to scream, as I said, <laughs> that's interesting, birds no birds, right? Um, and you know, lots of times in the past, you see these epic photos, and they're sometimes staged, like you see an owl flying towards the camera, perfect everything, lots of times the photographer has thrown a mouse or baited the animal, or when you see a perfect photo of like a family of animals and all of its babies on a log in the perfect light, Often in the past, those have been photographed uh, on game farms where photographers pay money to go photograph these creatures, but then they don't follow truth in captioning. So conservation photography is getting rid of all that nonsense. In my photography, I will never bait. My captions will always be truthful. 
I don't generally photograph a captive species, but if I am, you better be sure it's going to say it in the captioning. And it's also just realizing if I'm in the middle of nowhere photographing something, I'm going to act as if the whole world is watching me. So I'm not going to do anything to disturb the environment or upset that animal. Sometimes it may happen. You may flush a creature. Or the you may be photographing, and the animal may be like, "What are you doing here, lady?" You know, something can happen. But I sure as heck am gonna go out of my way to not have that happen. I hope you enjoyed that ten-minute answer, Scott. Yeah. Wow. No, that was uh, that was very powerful because I think a lot of people don't even know that there's a difference, and really that things like baiting and false caption or you know unclear captioning is going on but let's get to some of these pictures here if yeah. someone wants to learn more about wildlife conservation photography a great place to start is the north american nature photography association which i am a member of by the way car <laughs> carry member um and their whole basis is you know following that so if you want to read more about that they have a great section on their website that sounds crazy so this is a marine iguana, which is endemic to the Galapagos Islands, which are in Ecuador, and that is a lava lizard sitting on his head. It's actually a mutualistic relationship. The little lizard sits on his head because flies fly around the marine iguana and, and, and bug the marine iguana. So the lava lizard is like, I'll sit on your head, I'll eat flies, and you out. Plus, I'll pick all the dead skin off of your head, too. Then we've got a flightless cormorant. That animal's absolutely ridiculous and endemic to the Galapagos Island, which is one of the most amazing places I've ever been, and I love it. One. He's the cutest thing. Is this just called a little guy? Yeah, that's a that's a rhesus macaque, which is a, a monkey. That's it's an old world monkey, and this was shot in the town of Shimla, India. And the monkeys are everywhere, except people treat these monkeys like uh, New Yorkers treat rats. I personally think rats are cute because I'm that person. But you know, monkeys are looked at as vermin there, so I'm I'm, I'm shooting. Pause for the parrot screaming. I'm shooting the monkeys and people are all like, oh my god. There's a big monkey-human conflict in this area of India as well. Wow. They kind of, lots of packs of them run and, and, and cause problems sometimes. Monkeys are gonna monk, you know? <laughs> and now we're, now we're closer to home. Uh, there's a black bear, there's some foxes. Look at these foxes. Can I, can I just go get one of these foxes? These are super cute. Yeah, they're, they're adorable. They're absolutely adorable. This is in uh, the Catskills, which is, you know, some people say it's upstate, but people that are native to here are like, this isn't upstate, you gotta go further. I live uh, in the Catskills Mountain, which has amazing flora and fauna, and so the black bears from there. We've got foxes, we've got cute little deer. Oh, and this raccoon that's just kind of chilling. Believe it or not, that was in my yard. I went outside and my dog started barking and I looked up and there is a raccoon sleeping in a tree. Oh my God, and a bobcat. So this photo is just very special to me. I started DSLR camera trapping in November of 2019. And uh, this is just a bunch of combinations of stills, but essentially what it is, it's a, it's a remote camera. Yeah, so this is uh, this is featuring the greater adjunct stork, which is the rarest stork in the world. There is less than 1,200 of them left in the world. And uh, the photographs you're looking at were taken in uh, September of 2018. And I recently, this year, um, spent five weeks in India documenting greater adjunants and the woman who is leading a revolution with the Hargila army, a group of local women that is saving this endangered bird. So the pictures you're seeing are at a place called the Borogon landfill where a large population of greater adjunants lives. And you will be able to see in the next few months photos from my trip.
Yep, greater adjutants. I love those guys. And then... The rhesus monkey uh, sitting on the roof of a house. Is that what's happening here? Well, I particularly like this photo. This is in Shimla, India, again, where they have a big uh, monkey-human conflict, um, which is funny because aren't we all monkeys? But this is on a construction of a building, and this uh, this little guy is just sitting and kind of just, in my view, just kind of reflecting on the city. In my mind, I'm kind of like, he's thinking, where's my habitat? Where's it, it, it going? So right. uh, this is a good example of what I consider um, a pretty decent wildlife conservation photo. And and monkeys are smart, so they're taking advantage that humans are in their habitat. So of course, if you're sitting there eating eating some food, of course the monkey's gonna come up and grab your ice cream cone. Who wouldn't? Right. People get all mad. Oh, that monkey grabbed my food. Monk's in a monk. How long have you been photographing? Um, I actually got my first DSLR a little over five years ago, and I just fell in love with the art form. I started photographing uh, nature because um, I've just always had a big connection with wildlife and nature, and I just developed my skills through making tons and tons and tons of mistakes right. um, and just learning as I go and I gotta say it's one of my favorite art forms that I've I've ever found and I hope uh, people can learn and connect with wildlife through my photography I just I really love it yeah you're amazing at it and and all the each one of these photographs and all the photographs that I saw on your website they're all very provocative they're all very engaging Right, and that, that means a lot that that's coming through to you because it, it's very important, especially as I develop as a wildlife conservation photographer, is that these pictures um, speak for those that don't have a voice, as cliche as that sound, but make us humans, when we look at it, think, like, what's that monkey thinking that's sitting on a construction site and looking over the city, and what was there before the city, and what's the monkey thinking? You know, is he really such a bad guy for stealing my potato chips or would I do the same thing? <laughs> right. Five years, a short tenure as a photographer. And I think people would all agree that's a very short tenure. You've already won a number of awards. What are some of them? Um, well, I'm really honored to have won a few things. Um, I was the Reader's Choice winner of the Smithsonian uh, Photography Awards, the 16th annual one last year and that was chosen over out of like 48,000 photos and I got the most uh, out of 25,000 total votes of people voting um, and I actually went on assignment for smithsonianmagazine.com in February the story's uh, going to come out later in the year hopefully uh, that's how things go I can't wait to share it um, so yeah it is a short time it's one of those things I can't explain why things have happened the way they have. I just know that I'm super hashtag grateful and really happy, but I am I am working so hard at this every day, even though my parrot screams in my ear. You'd think I'd go in a quiet room for this, but no. no. I film this live thing with the parrot screaming in the background, right? Yeah. Let's just do it. It's really because my husband makes me live in this tiny room with the parrot. <laughs> Not allowed to oh, any but yes, it is, it is considered a short time. Um, that said, I really do love what I'm doing, and I wake up thinking about it, and I'm working on it every day. A lot of this is luck and skill meeting. I hope I continue to, to have good luck, and I, I know that I'm always developing my skills and talking as much as possible. <laughs> That's why we love you. Let us know when the Smithsonian feature comes out. I'd love that, and I'm, I'm just honored to be on this You're, while we're socially distanced. And uh, I'm tucked away in the Catskill Mountains. I consider myself very lucky, and my heart really goes out to, to you. I know you're in Queens. I, I'm just, I don't know. I had to bring it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I just want to oh. let everyone know that... Uh, I'm thinking about them, especially if you're in the eye of the storm like you are. So, so thanks for taking a bad situation and bringing a little joy to the world. Well, thank you, Carla. Be safe. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Again.
We are bringing up Abigail Palmer. There it goes. All right. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How are things where you are? We're right. at day 40. What's changed? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's there's kind of like, I just, I feel like people are making the most of it. Like, I kind of see it. Everyone's wearing masks where we are. I'm, I'm down in Virginia. I'm in Woodbridge, Virginia. Um, everyone's wearing masks across the board. Um, everyone's working from home. I see a lot of people outside, like exercising outside because it is allowed to exercise. And um, actually, my dog and I were um, were walking, taking a walk yesterday, and because uh, we're trying to get outside as much as we can too. And there was a <laughs> there was a seven year old birthday party, <laughs> and everyone had lined cars, and everyone had banners along the cars saying. Happy birthday, Cooper! Happy seventh birthday! Cooper. And it was like social distancing. It was like I was like walking by, like yeah, Cooper. Happy birthday, man! <laughs> That's awesome. So you know, I see I see people making the most of it, even though it is like it's just completely different. Yeah, well, it's Cooper like, oh. is never gonna forget that birthday. He never is. No, yeah, never. <laughs> and so, and what else are you working on? What other projects? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I'm a, a board-certified music therapist. I have a, a full-time job. I work with service members at Fort Belvoir. Um, but this is kind of giving me – and, you know, having a full-time job in music, um, it, I, I oftentimes come home and I'm just kind of like, Ugh, you know, but it's kind of giving me some time to really actually dive into it. I'm starting to write again. I'm starting to right. – kind of get some videos going again um <laughs> no but i i i'm I, I am starting to kind of get back into my own writing again which is kind of exciting that's so. fantastic let's play this here comes the sun <laughs> Here comes the sun, and I'm so 
amazing. That was <laughs> gorgeous. Thank you. For Earth Day 2020, um, it's good to hear a song like that. Today, as we were talking while the video was rolling, was a beautifully sunny day. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was a perfect day for a walk outside, just enjoying the earth. Yeah, and uh, you know, this song has been around a while. I'm sure you've played it many, many times. Um, you were working that harp like a boss, man. Like what, <laughs> there's those levers. I don't think I've ever even noticed that there's levers up there. You were da 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 da, you know. There sure are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> amazing. Um, Thank you. So, these days, does the song have a different resonance for you? Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. So I have played this song for, sorry, I'm getting another phone call. Because yeah. uh, I'm so busy, yeah. right? <laughs> no, this is your third one. You just have three of them lined up. We're oh running a little slow. God. Wow. 839. Um, I'm getting bumped. I played it when I was a teenager. I played this song for my cousin's wedding. Um, so, and then I've played it throughout my career as a music therapist. My dog is named after a Beatles song. His name is Rigby, after Eleanor Rigby. I, li I happen to like the Beatles. Um, but yeah, so, so basically, Here Comes the Sun, it, it's, um, uh, I think that everybody does need a sense of hope right now, um, because there is so much uncertainty. There are, you know, there's, um, kind of this, like, looming, I just feel this, like, looming anxiety around yeah. people and around and around socialization and i yeah. it's interesting because as as a time when i feel like everyone should be giving each other hugs to yeah. get through this we can't and in fact we should be doing the opposite so um it is kind of saying like despite despite everything despite this storm that we're all in there is this sense of um there's a sense of hope and there is uh, a future uh there's there's a light that's there's there's sun that's going to be coming down the down the pipe soon for us yeah and these are our new hugs you know yes. maybe not replacing old-fashioned hugs forever but for now you know this that music reaching out to people that mm -hmm. is like a warm embrace for sure right exactly yeah yeah, yeah. friday we are gonna have a therapist on oh, and we're good. Gonna, yeah we're gonna talk about these big trauma like big t trauma and little t trauma and this like not being able to hug and embrace like that is i think one of these sort of chronic little t traumas you know these traumas yeah. that we're all experiencing and um sarah thacker she's a wonderful therapist and she practices emdr and awesome. you know that that's very effective in helping people with trauma and so i just want to talk to her about that and you know, give folks um, some suggestions and recommendations to help them balance out that nervous system. Yeah, I think that that is really, really powerful. And actually, I work in a trauma mm -hmm. clinic, um, so it's uh, so it that that really speaks that resonates with me too. So I hope that's a great show on Friday. That's yeah, awesome. and uh, I'm gonna send them to your website so they they can just listen to your music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Abigail. Well, thank you. I appreciate you fitting us into your super busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Hair <And> I, flip. <laughs> I, I want to let you know that I already reached out to Scott Robinson because I love the work that we did, you know, trying to get two musicians together. And I'm, I'm telling Scott, like, let's bring them all, you know. Yeah, that would be so much fun. That grab would be the fun. band and let's figure group. this out. Scott's yeah. group is an amazing group. So that would be really, really cool. Yeah, fantastic. So. All right. Abigail, Thanks. be safe. Tell you, Rigby. Yes. Yep. I'll I'll tell him to bring the sun. There okay. you go. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. All right Abigail, thanks, Scott, thank for having you. me. I appreciate Talk it. To you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Very good stuff. Very very healing for sure. Um, just letting that music in. We're gonna hear some words uh, from Greta right now. My message is that we'll be watching you. <laughs> this is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. 
Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you are doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting up irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution or the aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us we who have to live with the consequences. To have a 67% chance of staying below a 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise, the best odds given by the IPCC, the world had 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit back on January 1st, 2018. Today that figure is already down to less than 350 gigatons. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone within less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up, and change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you. Somebody had to say it. There are some positive side effects from all of humanity being under quarantine. Uh, some of the air is clearing, some of the water is clearing, uh, some of the earth is healing indeed. And I just hope, because I don't see it on the news, but I hope that we're all taking note of that to remember the earth. Friday is going to be a special show, as Abigail and I were talking about. Uh, Sarah Thacker is one of the people that's going to be here with us. She's a therapist. We're going to talk about big T traumas and little T traumas and all the traumatic things that we're all 
processing and going through. I just want to make sure that we're acknowledging them. All right, everybody be safe. Hunker, hug, and haven. I love you guys, and we'll see you on Friday. That is a beautiful stream behind me. It is one of my finer creations. It's a babbling brook. There's nothing quite like it. It looks very peaceful. It is.